So I have the pleasure to give the floor to Benjamin Britton from the Stanford University with our best thanks to come here to Florence to this workshop. Inviting me here to speak to you. Um, I'm going to talk today about the results of an ongoing Andrew W. Mellon funded project for interoperability among a small number of digital manuscript projects. Uh, we're about halfway through that grant right now. Uh, so I'll present to you our goals and our current work and also the things that we hope to see by the end of our current funding cycle. I uh, have included Robert Sanderson from Los Alamos National Laboratory in the byline at the top. He is largely the architect for the data model that we're going to be talking about today uh, and a, a great colleague as well. So I just wanted to bring his name to the forefront because he's done a, a great deal of work uh, with us on this. Uh, the structure of what I'm going to talk to you about today <coughs> will follow five basic points. One is the, the background of the project itself, uh, and then the repository side infrastructure work that we've done to move from a silo to an open repository. I'm going to talk a little bit about why medieval manuscripts provide the perfect use case for this kind of digital library work. I'll speak a little bit about the data model that we're using, shared canvas, and then walk you through a few implementations and demonstrations uh, of the prototypes that we've built so far. So as an overview, as many of you probably know, the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation has been funding digital manuscript projects for several decades. Uh, the Ramon de Rose project at uh, Johns Hopkins University, uh, the Digital Image Archive of Medieval Music, uh, which is now at Oxford, uh, the Parker on the Run project, uh, and the Swiss Ecodices project, among many. Um, all of these have a few things in common. One, they had an inability to share data across their silos to satisfy scholarly use. Uh, they also had an inability to leverage existing infrastructure. Each one of these projects built their own viewing environments, built their own discovery environments, all very expensive front-end development work that could have been shared across projects had we been thinking in a more interoperable way. And they all shared the fact that there was no sustainability model for the data or for the access. Um, something that's changing now, but at the time that the work was being done, particularly three years ago when we started talking to Mellon about interoperability, uh, the question of sustainability was on everybody's mind. Uh, so we brought together a group of scholars, technologists, and digital library policy people uh, to begin discussions about what interoperability might mean for our small group of projects and uh, with the goal of developing some prototypes for interoperability between repositories and tools and then the end users who would be using them. So as we're probably all aware, the current state of the world that we live in is a world of silos, individual projects that don't speak to each other. Uh, as we started looking at the projects that were involved in our, our work, uh, we noticed that they all shared a very similar architecture. There was a data set of images and metadata about that project, usually stored in some sort of either proprietary or local uh, storage base. A layer of indexes and other tools which allowed you to access that material. And then a website for delivery and visualization and discovery of all of that material for end users. Uh, noticing that the architecture was almost identical across all projects, despite differences in programming languages and things like that, uh, led us to realize that uh, this wasn't necessarily the best system uh, for us to be using for our users who wanted to have access to images and metadata from all of the projects at the same time. This is not to say that silos aren't bad. Silos give us a lot of material that we didn't have access to before on the web. Easy access to our desktops. We have access to data from a single repository. This is always a good thing. Uh, we can use the tools that a given repository supports, and many repositories, of course, make some very interesting tools available from viewing and discovery to actual interaction with the, the material. 
Uh, we can see images in the way that the repositories allow, and some repositories have given us very good viewing material. Gallica, for instance, now has a wonderful um, JPEG 2000 based zoom and pan viewer that, that makes looking at their manuscripts wonderful. We can see carefully curated descriptions of the material. Uh, we can see approved additional material and more or less trust uh, that the bibliographies are correct and up to date, perhaps more complete or less complete than we might want, but uh, nonetheless a good starting point for research into a given object. We can search deeply within a single repository, uh, in some cases down to the, the word level. And of course we can browse across a single repository uh, to see what all uh, material is available there. However, our users kept telling us that there were things that the silos couldn't do, which they needed. And primarily that was access to data from any other repository. Uh, the Parker on the Web project has a large uh, set of Anglo-Saxon manuscripts, and the Anglo-Saxonists working with those manuscripts wanted to compare things that were in Parker with things that were in the British Library or held at Oxford or elsewhere. And we couldn't support that uh, in the current configuration uh, that we had. Silos so don't allow you to use any external tools, and we already know that there are some great transcription and annotation tools starting to appear, which we simply couldn't support because of the way that our data was stored and served. Uh, there are also great strides in uh, image viewing that are coming up. Multi-up viewers for comparison, uh, deep zoom uh, in some cases, uh, and some repositories can't support all of that. Uh, quite often, a user cannot contribute correct descriptions, and as we all know, many of us have built our uh, manuscript discoverability on older catalogs. In the case of the Parker Library, uh, <coughs> uh, an early 20th century catalog, others have used 19th and 18th century catalogs just for ease of use, and perhaps those are the most complete catalogs available at a time. Users also cannot add additional material or comments in some cases. Some science sites do support that, but it's not uniform across all of the silos. And unless federated search has been implemented, uh, as we've seen with some of the projects presented over the last few days, but one can't search across repositories in a very uh, comfortable way. So as we started working towards defining interoperability for us, we, uh, we recognized that there was a cluster of, of involved parties that needed to be considered. Digital libraries, software developers, and scholars. And in many cases, the boundaries between these groups are very porous. Some people wear multiple hats, um, and of course the feedback between all of these groups is very important. Our first step was to start breaking down the silos. Uh, and to do that, we wanted to separate our data from the applications that served and consumed it. We agreed to share data models and programming interfaces, and to enable interactions at the tool and repository level. <coughs> so from an architectural point of view, uh, we could visualize this by saying that the lower third of this page, the image data and the canonical metadata that the repositories hold, can become a standalone data set. We want to build hooks so that other people can access that, but essentially it is just a pool that the libraries can, can preserve and care for and serve up. Uh, most of the repositories will want to have some sort of user interface, and the experiments that we've been doing have dealt entirely with open source and free software for image viewing and discovery. We wanted to see if we could uh, start chipping away at the problem of the high cost of developing front ends for our projects. So with a good, strong pool of data and cheap front-end tools that we know are going to be replaced on a regular basis, we think we can bring down the costs of the projects overall. More importantly though, separating out that image and, the and metadata uh, allows us to open it up to third-party development, to transcription tools and annotation tools for image analysis, new image viewers, other discovery projects, and more excitingly, Tool X, that tool that we don't imagine yet, that will somehow serve a scholar's scientific needs uh, that we want to support. At the moment, uh, we have uh, working production versions of the separated repository and repository user interface. I think many projects have looked at this approach already. 
And then more exciting for us this year, we've opened up our underlying data to third-party tools, which I'll demonstrate later. The second half of our currently funded project is going to be working on bringing information created by those tools back into the repository so that we have an environment where there's a data round trip. Our data goes out, tools produce new data that can come back in and enrich our resources. This breaks down to a four-point infrastructure uh, that we've been dealing with. There's a repository manifest, essentially just a list of what we have. It's free and open to the public. You can download it, please crawl it, do anything you want with it. Build new catalogs if you'd like. There's a digital stacks, that is where we've stored this. And uh, there's an API for access to that, uh, which we're also happy to share in public slides. Uh, there's an application programming interface that tells developers how to get this material. And then there's a set of linked data technologies, primarily the shared canvas data model, uh, that helps us tie it all together. So what I've been talking about so far has been primarily basic digital library infrastructure development. Uh, we're implementing this for books, for newspapers, for other objects that we hold. But medieval manuscripts provide a particularly compelling use case because of their complexity. Um, quite often they don't behave in book-like ways. Uh, their inability to, uh, to get in easily to OCR and other uh, mechanized methods. So these very special boutique objects are the things that we would like to support at the highest level, the most complex objects we can find. When we started working on this, uh, both from the technology and I think from our scholarly partner's point of view, we had a number of implicit assumptions that led us astray to begin with. <clears throat> Primarily among those assumptions was that everybody agreed what a manuscript is. And as we've heard over the last couple of days, uh, there are many definitions for what a manuscript might be, which causes problems when technologists are trying to program against an assumption, of course. Slightly more complex is the relationship between that real-world manuscript, however it's defined, and the facsimiles that we're actually serving out of the digital libraries. And yet even more complex is the relationship between work produced against those facsimiles to the actual real-world object. So all of these were things that we had to start pulling apart as we, as we started working with this material. So what does this mean for digital tools? It means working closely with the scholars to understand the use cases and needs uh, that they have in order to be able to respond in ways that they may not have uh, made explicit when they first started working with us. It's challenged us to rethink digital facsimiles in a shared, distributed, and global space. Uh, quite frequently, we're working with project teams that are spread across multiple continents or studying materials that are held in far-flung repositories. And it's challenged us to enable collaboration and encourage engagement, of course, uh, as all interoperable projects do. So when we began working with the manuscripts, <clears throat> we started looking for a way of understanding, from a data modeling point of view, exactly what the object was that we were dealing with. And the most sensible way that we could understand this was as a very information-dense page, a package, that can be un unthreaded uh, in a number of different ways. A scholar might look at this simply from its artistic point of view and want to describe in full detail the artistic elements, of course. Um, the simple layout of the page or the content of the page might have political and social implications that need to be pulled out or discussed. The text, of course, everybody is interested in. Uh, the codicological and paleo paleographical elements are all objects of scientific study in their own right. And, of course, there are things that we can't even imagine scholars might want to look at uh, now uh, that is somehow encoded into the real-world page. So taking account of all of this rich data uh, was a challenge to begin with. <laughs> even more challenging was uh, scholarly assumptions about working with surrogates. And uh, what we found frequently, particularly in publications, were that scholars talked about the real-world object even though they had been working exclusively or primarily with facsimiles of that object. So, in a sense, they were saying, I'm talking about the manuscript, but all of the information I'm using is coming directly from the facsimile I use. It causes an interesting problem uh, when we started data modeling, and our response was to just make 
make explicit the fact that all of the work we were doing in the digital realm uh, is facsimile based and that uh, was somehow discussing a real world object. So when we began working, particularly with scholars in the realm of transcription, we took what we called a naive approach. That is, we worked with the facsimiles as if we were working with the real object. As you can see in the image above, uh, in the blue dotted line, uh, we have a text that was transcribed, La Terre de Ceci. Uh, this appears on a Matthew Paris uh, itinerary, and it's, it's pretty clearly a text drawn directly from an image. This works very well in many cases, except for the fact that there can be multiple images or multiple states of a given folio that we're transcribing from. So this particular text shows up on this page, but only if the flap on that page is folded out. So how do we deal with that from a facsimile point of view? We want to know that that text is contained in this page, but we can't actually see it. And there happen to be four different versions or states of this particular folio, with one flap folded out, in this case, where we see our text, in this case with two flaps folded out, where we see our text, and in this case on the verso of that folio, where the flap is folded down behind, and we see that text upside down. With scholars, we don't want to be making that transcription three times once upside down for every appearance of the uh, image as it is. So we want our annotation, our transcription, to apply to uh, some ideal uh, concept of what that page is, to, independent of the state where we might see the facsimile of it. And Rob Sanderson came up with the idea of using a canvas paradigm that would refer to an empty space that stood in for the, the real world object. This would then allow us to build up layers of, aggregation, uh, of aggregated annotations, transcriptions, images, media material, uh, that all pointed to that real world object without having to rely on one specific facsimile uh, to pull that information together. This approach makes explicit the fact that the image itself is a surrogate and could be replaced at any time. The technology to do this is largely based on the open annotation uh, collaboration approach, uh, their data model for creating annotations, uh, which is focused, uh, again, it's a Mellon-funded project, and its focus is on interoperable sharing of annotations. It's web-centric, it's not locked into silos, it's not locked into any implementation or language. Uh, it's simply a data model that can be implemented in a number of different ways. There are a few things to pick apart, though, in discussing what we mean when we talk about annotation in this context. Most of us are familiar with the fact that an annotation could be a scholarly commentary about a manuscript or any other object. In this case, an annotation is simply something about something else. It doesn't matter whether it's textual, media, image, conceptual, whatever. Something about something else, and that aboutness is the key for the open annotation approach. So their actual data model is very simple. There is an RDF document that says that one thing, in this case the body, is about something else, the target or some part of that target. Its simplicity is slightly deceiving because this can, of course, grow in complexity. The target could be a part of another thing. Uh, the body could be a part of something else. Perhaps you wanted to take uh, one section of the TEI XML encoded file and point it to one part of an image. This model allows that. It also allows creation of annotations, about annotations, about annotations, ad infinitum, all linked together in a linked data layer. That then allows us to use this blank canvas as the target for a number of different types of annotations. In this case, we could simply overlay an image. From a user's point of view, it's going to look as if you were just looking at an image in an image viewer, but in reality, you're looking at two layers space and an image layer on top of that. What that means practically is that we could make a transcription using that image and have that transcription apply to the blank canvas so that you could switch out an image, perhaps a black and white versus a color image or a high resolution versus a low resolution image and have that text still apply to the same place on the image as I'll show you in a little bit. 
In our primary use case, we had an old microphone digitized and a few uh, high resolution color images uh, also digitized, which we were using to switch out back and forth. So you have a choice between two different images as you start painting your canvas. If, for instance, you were interested in the scratches on the microphone for some arcane reason, perhaps you would want to look at that. We can also then build up ever more complex layers of textual annotation, uh, line by line, word by word, or letter by letter, attaching all of those letters, uh, words, or lines to the spaces on the canvas uh, where they would appear, and then overlay the images on top. This gives us the ability then to start creating virtual manuscripts out of these uh, empty canvases. In the case of Codex Angolensis 1394, we have uh, five different fragments pasted down onto a single page. Well, in scholarly research, we might want to imagine what those original manuscripts would look like. Uh, one scholar might argue that uh, the top fragment belonged to an independent page whereas the two larger vertical images belong to a single page. Scholar Y comes along and says, no, no, no. In fact, the large image, uh, vertical image uh, fragment belongs by itself, and they can then argue about that uh, in a digital way, and we can record all of that and rebuild the argument. This approach allows us to attach both textual annotations and media and uh, we have an implementation up on the Shared Canvas site, which I'll give you in a moment, of uh, an overlaid performance of a musical manuscript uh, broken out line by line, so that if you were teaching with this material, for instance, you could have your student look at the manuscript and also hear an interpretive performance of the music on that page at a single time. Again, all just done by layering up of annotations onto our blank canvas. This also allows us to recreate historical states of manuscripts when we know that the portions are missing, uh, but we also know that we have something to say about that. For instance, the Augustine Gospels at the Parker Library, we know that there are several pages that have been lost or removed. Uh, between folio verso, uh, two verso and folio three recto, for instance, uh, there's a missing folio. And on the verso of that folio, there was a frontispiece to the Book of Matthew. We know that because it bled through onto folio 3 recto, and we know it's gone. So we can say something about this missing piece. Uh, we can create a canvas for it, start adding annotations to it, and it becomes part of the digital aggregated object, uh, and then uh, allows us to visualize that in different ways. It allows us to handle the case of historical rebindings. Bibliothèque Nationale de France, Francais 113 to 116, a wonderful, a very beautiful, large uh, Lancelot de Lac, uh, was rebound into four volumes from its original one single large volume. On the web, we can present that in its original binding format by removing all of the new material and sequencing the canvases in one way, or we can show it as it exists in the library right now. Which is all to say that this gives us a lot of flexibility in presenting these materials on the web and sharing them across projects. How this works in practice, then, uh, I'll walk you through. We have a, a stacks, you are a digital stacks, where we've got all of our images stored. Uh, we have a prototype third-party image viewing and discovery tool <coughs> built on Project Blacklight. And we're serving up these images to external tools for transcription and annotation. So there are multiple ways to access the material that we're holding in our stacks, either the way that we mediate or any other way that a project might want to uh, explore. Mm -hmm. So I'll take a look at those briefly. Yeah. So if we look at our oops, there we go. If we look at our digital repository, which unfortunately is under authorization at the moment. Um, so you can see that there are images there, but we can't actually access them from here. This shows that um, while we've locked out users. Uh, to go directly to the Stanford Stacks for this manuscript. There are other ways of getting at this because we're serving the material out to external tools. So if we look at our, uh, our prototype index, again built on Project Blacklight, we could navigate to the Berry Bible in the Parker Medieval Manuscripts uh, fairly quickly. 
really simply by fastening down. The tool itself is pulling thumbnail images from the, the manuscripts on the fly directly out of stacks so we can see uh, the material as it's being presented uh, out of the stacks at a small scale. We can dig in a little bit deeper if we want to take a look at if we want to take a look at a uh, further description of the manuscript. Things seem to be just a little slow. Always the joy of working with prototypes. <clears throat> While we wait for our local installation to uh, to load, uh, let me show you what then we can do with external tools. So, taking you to the TPEN tool at St. Louis, this is a dedicated transcription tool uh, that allows a user to work directly with manuscript uh, canvases uh, served out of uh, various repositories, and in the uh, interest of time, I've already set up a project for the manuscript that we'll be looking at. Here. And you can see that the tool is actually requesting on the fly an image from the Stanford stacks. And hopefully this will move just a little bit quicker. And while that's loading, let me take you to a third tool that's also pulling images from our stacks, uh, which is the digital Mapamundi tool, or the DM tool which is essentially a scholar's desktop for uh, annotation. Enough, this was working just fine shortly before uh, we talked. There we go. Okay. So here we have our description of the, the manuscripts being pulled directly out of stacks. Anybody in a third party tool could use this. Um, the list of folios is currently being supplied by the manifest that we make open to everybody so that you could rebuild this on your own if you wanted to. If you had a scholarly project that was looking at large format Bibles, for instance, you could build your own display of this material. And, uh, let's see. Let's see if we can find something that actually works. We have some implementations, of course, also just to show off the, the shared canvas data model approach. And I'll use the most basic one to help you visualize what it is that we're talking about. As I mentioned, we're one year into a two year project. In summary and conclusion, I'd just like to say a few things about what we would like to see 
uh, next. First of all, uh, our model, which is built on annotation and collaboration at its heart, and particularly interoperability uh, at the link data level between repositories, um, is fixed but needs much refinement. Uh, we would love to have more partners engaged with the shared canvas data model so that we can test its parameters further. Uh, perhaps there are implications for projects here that might be interested in using it, in which case we're more than happy to help get you set up, uh, help explain in more detail how the manifests are built, how the uh, data model is implemented. And by the end of our current project, we'll also have a test virtual machine that you can use uh, that implements the data model and that you can stick your own material into to experiment with. And we're happy to give that to anybody who wants it, so stay in touch with me. Um, we're also preparing uh, to start a second round of this work, and our explicit goal is to move out of the realm of the small melon funded projects that we're currently engaged with, and talk specifically to larger uh, manuscript repositories. Uh, we have a small amount of manuscript material between our own funded projects, nothing on the order of the large libraries here in Europe. And we would love to find partners who are interested in interoperability at the most basic level uh, that we could work with uh, and help implement in this way. Uh, so I, thank you. I apologize for the, uh, the lack of working examples, uh, but again, uh, these slides are available on the internet. All of the links are available. If you go to uh, SlideShare, uh, you can find these already implemented, and I'm also happy to provide the full slide deck to the workshop and to anybody who's interested. On the slides, I list all of the open source software and the tools that I've talked about today. And uh, we also have uh, several web resources that describe in more detail both the data model and the project that we're currently engaged with. Uh, there's also a paper on the shared canvas data model that's available 